most people would call the New Testament. Now we do the Torah portion, the Haftorah portion, and the Brit Hadashah portion because if nothing else, the Word of God or the Word of Yahweh is more important to do than anything else. So we definitely make sure to do that every week that we have service. Then we get into the drosh or the teaching for the night. And this could be on various subjects and you should be able to see the subject of tonight's drosh down below in the title of this video. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast and if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, be sure to contact us at team at godhonesttruth.com. God Honest Truth Ministries is a ministry supported completely by our Father Yahweh and by viewers like you. If you'd like more information about donating to God Honest Truth Ministries, you can find the links through our website at GodHonestTruth.com. There you can find the links for Buy Me A Coffee, Kofi, and Venmo. There are also other ways to donate as well. You can do that through GabPay, PayPal, you can do it through Facebook, various different means. If you have any questions about donating, you can always contact us at team at GodHonestTruth.com. As of November 2022, God Honest Truth Ministries is not a 501c3 organization. Come join us on all the various social media platforms. Come like and follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Truth Social, on Parler, on Gab, wherever you happen to be, we're probably there also. And you can find all the links to our social media profiles on our website at www.GodHonestTruth.com.
So while you're waiting for the video and the live stream to start, why don't you go down below and help us out by hitting that like button. Also hit that subscribe button as well as ring the bell so that you're notified every time that we go live or upload an on-demand video. Hit that share button and share tonight's stream around with your friends, family, coworkers, or who have you. And also go down below and leave us a comment. Say hi, Shabbat Shalom, or what have you, because we always love hearing from you. We always love hearing from you, and if you ever need to contact us with any comments, questions, suggestions, or concerns, or what have you, you can always contact us directly through email at team at godhonesttruth.com, or you can contact us through one of our many social media profiles, which you can find the links to on our website, godhonesttruth.com. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed tonight's live stream. The stream will be starting shortly, so just hang on just a short while longer. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of God Honest Truth live stream. We are God Honest Truth, and we are a Messianic ministry based out of Western North Carolina. If you'd like to find out more about us, please go to www.godhonesttruth.com. There you can find all the information about the ministry. You can find resources to help you in your understanding and learning of Hebrew. You can find audio Bibles and so much more. You can also find ways to contact us, whether that be through social media profiles where you can find all the links on our website, or the best way to contact us is directly through email at team at godhonesttruth.com. Now tonight's drosh comes with a little bit of a warning. Tonight's drosh is going to be all about traditions, and unfortunately when you start talking about traditions and you start getting into scripture and evidence and history and stuff like that, Sometimes people's toes tend to get stepped on, so just be made aware of that. There may be some traditions that you hold near and dear that we may be discussing tonight. So viewer discretion is advised in that aspect, but it's going to be chock full of scriptures. So definitely make sure to stay tuned for tonight's drosh on traditions. 
Now, before we get into that, we're of course going to be doing our live stream liturgy. We're going to be doing our Torah portion, our Haft Torah portion, and our Brit Hadashah portion like always. Because if nothing else, we're going to be doing the word of Yahweh above anything else that we might do. So, with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into our liturgy. Behold, believe of Panima, Nefesh Yehudi, Omiyam, Ufateh Misrak Kadima, Ayin Lezion Sofiyam, O Lo of Dove, Tikvatenu, ah, tikva bashno tapaim, the he yotam kovshi, behartenu, eret zion verushalayim, the he yotam kovshi, behartenu, Eretz Zion Verushalayim Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malhuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is for eternity. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house, and upon your gates. So in the way of announcements this week, of course, we're going to be giving you the upcoming episode list for about the next two months or so. It's a nice drosh. Like we said, it's going to be all about traditions. So, excuse me, definitely make sure to stay tuned for that. Next week, it's going to be getting into another subject that may or may not be kind of touchy, depending on your background and where you come from. And that's going to be a discussion on Bible and alcohol. Some people say that it's a sin or it's wrong to drink alcohol. Other people say it's okay to drink alcohol, but what does the scripture say? We're going to be getting into all of that next week at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and make sure to tune in every week to catch each of these upcoming episodes at Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, here is your le le can talk tonight. Here is your list of upcoming feast days or moedim for the next year, all the way through. Hanukkah of next year. And of course, our next upcoming feast day is going to be Purim. And that's going to be coming up on March 6th at sunset. And it runs through March 7th at sunset of 2023. Now, like always, we'll be having a drosh on Purim and each feast day about two weeks before that feast day occurs. So if you'd like to learn more about that particular feast day, or if you'd like to know more about the symbology or the customs, how to celebrate it, and of course the food, which always comes along with it, then make sure to tune in for that drosh on that feast day about two weeks before the feast day happens. And as always, if you have any prayer requests or announcements that you would like to have announced live on air, make sure to have those in to us by Thursday evening at the latest, because we do go live on Friday evenings. Now, if you would like for us to help pray for you and not have it announced live, that's perfectly all right, too. Just send us an email, and we'll pray for you without announcing it on the live stream. 
There is one other announcement that I would like to remind everyone. In the past, we have reminded you that if you are in the Western North Carolina area, especially the Asheville and Weaverville area, and you want to meet in person, we do want to get eventually into a in-person fellowship and service. So let us know that you're in the area and that you would like in-person fellowship in a messianic context, and we can stay in touch. And as soon as we have enough interest, we'll get a place, we'll get everything started, and we'll eventually have in-person fellowship. But we do need you to reach out to us. Let us know that you're in the area, that you're interested, and some way to stay in contact also. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get back to tonight's liturgy. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. He walked among us, filled with your Spirit. The only one who ever perfectly fulfilled your Torah. He healed the sick and raised the dead. The multitudes of our people sought his touch. He taught as no man taught. With authority he brought forth the treasures of the Torah. How the children sought him, the lepers he touched and made clean. How the despised and outcast found love and release from their sin. How the hypocrites feared him, whose words uncovered their sin. Despised and rejected, acquainted with grief, he bore the sins of Israel. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned every one to his own way. Our iniquities were laid upon the king, the sins of the world, his burden to bear. He rose from the dead and opened the way to life everlasting. Praise his name. We are in him. His spirit empowers. New life is ours with joy and peace. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has given us Messiah our King. For the sake of our Master Yeshua and his merit and virtues, may the sayings of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be favorable before you, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Avinu Sheba Shemayim Yit Kadesh Shemcha Tavo Mehutecha Yeasa Retzonecha Baaretz Kaasher Naasa Vashemayim Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done as on earth, so as in heaven. Ten lanu hayom lechem hukenu, usalach lanu et ashmatenu ka asher, so lechem anachnu la asher ashmulanu. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Ve'al tevienu lide masa. Ki im hatzilenu min hara. Ki lecha, hamam lecha, vahagavura, vahatifaret, la olame, olamim. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. None can compare to you, O Lord, and nothing compares to your creation. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your mercy endures throughout all generations. The Lord is king. The Lord was king. The Lord shall be king throughout all time. May the Lord grant his people mercy. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt him together. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forth, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. All right, and tonight's Torah portion is going to be Exodus chapter 27, verse 20 through chapter 28, verse 43. And if you would like to follow along with us at home in your preferred translation, we'll give you just a moment to find your position in the scriptures.
Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, through chapter 28, verse 43. And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tent of appointment, outside the veil, which is before the witness, Aaron and his sons are to tend it from evening until morning before Yahweh, a law forever to their generations from the children of Israel. And you, bring near Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, for serving as a priest to me, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron. And you shall make set-apart garments for Aaron, your brother, for esteem and for comeliness. And you, speak to all the wise of heart, whom I have filled with a spirit of wisdom, and they shall make the garments of Aaron to set him apart for him to serve as priest to me. And these are the garments which they make, a breastplate, a shoulder garment, a robe, an embroidered long shirt, a turban, and a girdle. And they shall make set-apart garments for Aaron your brother and his sons for him to serve as priest to me. And they shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, and shall make the shoulder garment of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen, the work of a skilled workman. It is to have two shoulder pieces joined at its two edges so it is joined together, and the embroidered band of the shoulder garment which is on it is of the same workmanship made of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen. And you shall take two shohem stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and the remaining six names on the other stone according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. Set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the garment as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders for a remembrance. And you shall make settings of gold, and two chains of clean gold like braided cords, and fasten the braided chains to the settings. And you shall make a breastplate of right ruling, a work of a skilled workman, like the work of the shoulder garment. Make it of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet material, and fine woven linen. It is square, doubled, a span its length, and a span its width. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row is a ruby, a topaz, and an emerald. The second row is a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row is a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row is a beryl, and a shoham, and a jasper. They are set in gold settings. And the stones are according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name for the twelve tribes. And you shall make braided chains of corded work for the breastplate at the end, of clean gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate, and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And you shall put the two cords of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two cords you fasten to the two settings, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the shoulder garment in the front. And you shall make two gold, I'm sorry, and you shall make two rings of gold, and shall put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the shoulder garment. And you shall make two rings of gold, and put them on the two shoulder pieces, underneath the gold shoulder garment, on the front of it, close to the seam above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment. And they bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the shoulder garment, using a blue cord so that it is above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, so that the breastplate does not come loose from the shoulder garment. And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of right ruling over his heart when he goes into the set-apart place for a remembrance before Yahweh continually. And into the breastplate of right ruling you shall put the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be on the heart of Aaron when he goes in before Yahweh. And Aaron shall bear the right ruling of the children of Israel on his heart before Yahweh continually. 
and you shall make the robe of the shoulder garment all of blue. And the opening for, its, for his head shall be in the middle of it, a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a scaled armor, so that it does not tear. And on its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron to attend in, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the set-apart place before Yahweh, and when he comes out, so that he does not die. And you shall make a plate of clean gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, set-apartness to Yahweh. And you shall put it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban. And it shall be on the forehead of Aaron, and Aaron shall bear the guilt of the set-apart gifts which the children of Israel set apart in all their set-apart gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead for acceptance for them before Yahweh. And you shall weave the long shirt of fine linen, and shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the girdle of woven work, and make long shirts for Aaron's sons, and you shall make girdles for them, and you shall make turbans for them, for esteem and comeliness. And you shall put on them on Aaron your brother, and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them, and shall ordain them, and shall set them apart, and they shall serve as priests to me. And make linen trousers for them, to cover their nakedness, reaching from the waist to the thighs. And they shall be on Aaron, and on his sons, when they come into the tent of appointment, or when they come near the slaughter place, to attend in the set-apart place, so that they do not bear crookedness and die, a law forever to him, and to his seed after him. Orukata Yahweh, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Torah Temet, Vechaye Olam Metukenu, Orukata Yahweh, Noten Ha Torah. Amen. This is the Torah which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come. Renew our days as of old. Etahim hi, lamahazim kimba, betomeha mehushar, deraheha, Dahe noam, Veho nativo te ha shalom. Ashi venu adonai, Ele ha vena shuva. Hadesh, Hadesh amenu. Hadesh amenu. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Amen. All right, and tonight's Haftorah portion is going to be Hosea chapter 14, verses 4 through 9. And once again, we'll give you just a moment to find that in your preferred translation at home if you'd like to follow along with us. Hosea chapter 14, verses 4 through 9. I shall heal their backsliding. I shall love them spontaneously, for my displeasure has turned away from him. I shall be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily and strike out his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his splendor shall be like an olive, like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. 
Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive like grain and blossom like the vine and become as fragrant as the wine of Lebanon. What more has Ephraim to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit comes from me. Who is wise and understands these words, discerning and knows them? For the ways of Yahweh are straight, and the righteous walk in them, but the transgressors stumble in them. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the living word in Messiah Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. And tonight's Brit Hadashah portion is going to be Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And one last time, we'll give you just a moment to find that in your preferred translation at home. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua the Son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all respects as we are, apart from sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu HaDevar HaEmet VeChaye Olam BeTukenu, Baruch Ata Yahweh Noten Habrit Chadasha. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who gave to us the Word of Truth and planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, Giver of the Renewed Covenant. Amen. All right, so just a moment. We're going to take a slight break to check on our live streams. If you are having trouble watching on YouTube, you can also go to Odyssey or Twitch and watch us there. Now, of course, the best way to watch us is always going to be at our website, www.godhonesttruth.com. And in fact, if you go there right now, you'll be able to see a post right on the front page. For tonight's drosh, you'll be able to watch the live stream directly from there as well as look through the drosh slides for yourself. Go through them at your own speed. If you're one to take notes, you can always pause on a certain slide. Very, very helpful and beneficial. Also from our website, you can click on the live stream and go directly to live stream from there as well. No need to search through the search bar on a particular website. All right there for your convenience. Now, before we get started on tonight's drosh, go down below in the comments and let us know what is it when it comes to traditions that automatically comes to mind. Is it one particular tradition? Is it how you feel about particular traditions? What have you? I mean, just go ahead and put it down below or even just say, hi, Shabbat Shalom, because we always love hearing from you there too. But while you're down there, also make sure to hit that like button and hit the subscribe button as well as ring the bell. So that way you're notified every time that we go live or when we upload an on-demand video. And also hit that share button and share it around with your friends, family, coworkers, or who have you. Because if you're watching this right now, odds are someone that you know would enjoy this type of content also. So go ahead and hit that share button and share it with someone that you know. All right, so like I said earlier, tonight's drosh is gonna be all about traditions and also, like I said before, make sure to go ahead and take your shoes off. It'll be a lot easier to step on your toes that way. But hopefully we'll just be getting into a lot of information, be good for you, that you've got an open mind and a willing to learn heart, and you'll be able to absorb all this. Now, as always, if we happen to miss anything, or if you think we happen to get something incorrect, by all means, please give us a contact so that we can all learn together. And hopefully each of us in our own way, will be further educated because of this. 
Now, I already told you about stepping on toes, but diving right into the drosh on traditions. Traditions are something that we kind of implicitly know what they are, even if we can't define them or recite a textbook definition. For example, right here, the Oxford Dictionary states that a tradition is a transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation. Yeah, we kind of implicitly knew that already. Or it could also be a doctrine believed to have divine authority, even though it's not in Scripture. Now, this is true regardless of what background you come from, whether it be a Jewish background, or if you're like me, you come from a Baptist background, or if you come from a Catholic background, Pentecostal background, et cetera, et cetera. We all come from some kind of background where there was a tradition that may or may not have been from Scripture. Now, that hits on another point. Traditions in themselves are not bad. Okay, traditions can be good. They can be bad or they can be neutral, actually. But in and of themselves, traditions are not bad. It really depends on where the traditions come from and what's involved in the tradition itself. If it's a tradition that comes from scripture, then yeah, it's good. If it's a tradition that comes from paganism, then yeah, that's bad. However, if it doesn't come from paganism and it doesn't come from scripture, but scripture doesn't prohibit it, then it's more in a neutral territory, right? So again, you just have to examine each tradition for itself to see whether or not it's good or bad. For example, here in the United States, we have a tradition of celebrating our Independence Day on July 4th. Now, that doesn't come from paganism. It doesn't come from Scripture. And it's not against Scripture. Scripture doesn't prohibit it. So it's more in the neutral territory. However, you get into something like Christmas, and that's a tradition that many people hold to. But it's a tr tradition that comes from paganism. So that would make it a bad tradition. Now, for more information on that, go back and see the drosh we did on Christmas just a few weeks ago. Some more of the positive traditions we'll be getting into in just a moment. So hang on for that. But did you know that scripture itself speaks both good and bad about traditions because traditions can be either good or bad? For instance, in Matthew 15, 3, Yeshua says, <clears throat> Matthew 15, 3, But Yeshua answering said to them, Why do you also transgress the command of Elohim because of your tradition? So the Pharisees had a tradition that was actually breaking and going against and transgressing a commandment of Yahweh. Can you think of something today that, you know, mainstream faiths might adhere to that is a tradition of theirs but would transgress the commands of Yahweh. One I can think of offhand <clears throat> is the tradition of Sunday being the Sabbath. Now, that is a tradition held by mainstream Christianity that actually transgresses and breaks Scripture because Yahweh told us in His Scripture that the seventh day is the Sabbath, not the first. So we can see kind of how traditions are working there. Also, Mark 7, 7 through 13. And in vain they do worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. Forsaking the command of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. And he said to them, Well, do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such traditions you do? Now, on the same line of thinking here with Yeshua, We've already mentioned Christmas and Sunday, but we can also throw in there a tradition like Easter, right? Easter is one of those things that is a tradition, but it comes from paganism, which transgresses or nullifies the word of Yahweh, which states, do not follow after the pagans. Do not worship me in the way they worship their gods, right? See how traditions can be bad at some instances? And scripture even talks about traditions being, or some traditions being bad anyways. But not all traditions. Let's look at this. Colossians 2.8. Paul writing here, he says, See to it that no one makes a prey of you through philosophy and empty deceit 
according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary matters of the world, and not according to Messiah. So Paul is warning us here not to be taken away by these traditions of men, that we can be deceived by them, even through philosophy in addition to these traditions. We have to examine each one and what it entails, where it came from, to see whether it is a good tradition, a bad tradition, or even maybe a neutral tradition. However, like we alluded to before, Scripture does not always speak bad about traditions. It even speaks positively sometimes about good traditions. For instance, 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, And I praise you, brothers, that you remember me in every way and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. So Paul handed down some traditions to the church at Corinth and probably others as well. But nevertheless, he handed down certain traditions and here he is advising them to keep the traditions that he handed down to them because he knew they were right and good. And being a well-taught Pharisee and a apostle, someone who was converted by Yeshua himself, he knew whether a tradition would be good or bad. And he handed these down to his various churches, including the church here at Corinth. Now, when examining these traditions, some of these traditions can cause us to sin, right? If they're a bad tradition, they can cause us to sin. However, make sure to keep in mind what a sin is. 1 John 3, 4, everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So remember, Sin is the breaking of the Torah, the breaking of Yahweh's commands. So if a tradition causes us to break one of Yahweh's commands, that tradition causes us to sin, which is one reason why we should examine the traditions that we hold to and know where they come from, what's involved with them, and where the customs that are involved with the traditions, where they come from as well. Because it could be causing us to sin. So, with all that base work laid out, let's go ahead and dive right into our first tradition here. And this is the tradition of Zizi. Now, you may be thinking, well, okay, hold on, we'll get into that in just a minute. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. But anyways, ZZ are tassels, right? They're specially knotted tassels that you attach to your clothes or attach to garments. Uh, I've seen them hanging from rearview mirrors before too. But ZZ shares its root word with the Hebrew for lock of hair. Now, if you're a nerd like me, the Strong's number for this is 6734, right? And it even says here in the Strong's uh, entry that it's a four lock of hair, a tassel right? And if you've never seen a zit zit before, this is one style of zit zit, okay? Now here you have two different kinds of zit zit. We'll put it that way. One is right, one is wrong. And this is where tradition kind of comes into the whole discussion of zit zit. Now, this is not the only style of ZZ. What you see on your screen here is a style more referred to as Sephardic or Ashkenazi style. Recently, or the last time I made ZZ for myself, I actually started doing a different style, and this is called um, more along the Karite version. Now, these are easy to make, as such are the ones on your screen there are easy to make. And we've actually done a video on how to tie ZZ, <clears throat> and the video we did was in the Sephardic or Ashkenazi style that you see on your screen there. If you are someone who would like to know how to tie these, this style, the Karite style, then please let us know and we'll be happy to make a video on how to tie these as well. These are just as easy as the other style to make. But we get the commandment for ZZ straight from Scripture. Numbers 15, 37 through 40. 
And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them to make zitzit on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue cord in the zitzit of the corners. And it shall be to you for a zitzit, and you shall see it, and shall remember all the commands of Yahweh, and excuse me, and shall do them, and not search after your own heart and your own eyes after which you went whoring, so that you remember and shall do all my commands and be set apart unto your Elohim. Now, notice a couple of different things here. Number one, it says, speak to the children of Israel. Remember that because we're going to get into that in just a moment. <clears throat> so set that aside, put it on the back burner, let it simmer. But speak to the children of Israel. Also, it says, make zitzit on the corners of their garments. Now, in some translation, it says, put zitzit on the borders of their garments. Okay. A lot of people, including myself, we do four zitzit. All right. But there's really no certain number given here. And that's one important thing to remember. Scripture does not define the number of zitzit that you're supposed to be wearing, right? It could be two, five, thirty. You know, as long as you're wearing them, you're keeping with the commandment. But the number of zitzit you have on is rather irrelevant when it comes to what Scripture lays out. Another thing, later on it says to put a blue cord in the zitzit of the corners. So in each of the zitzit, there's supposed to be a blue cord. Let's go back and look at the previous picture. Here you see, like I said, one that's wrong, one that's right. Now, according to scripture, the one on bottom is correct. It is right because it has a cord of blue in it. The one on top is incorrect. It's actually going against scripture because it does not have a cord of blue. Now, unfortunately, Lots of Jews wear the tzitzit that's on the top, the all white. And this is because of Jewish tradition, which states that they don't know which mollusk or snail or whatever it is they got the blue dye from. They couldn't find it, so they're not going to wear blue until they find that. But when we go back to look at the actual commandment for tzitzit, it doesn't say where tzitzit with a blue cord made from a certain dye produced from a certain creature. No, it just says, wear zitzit and make sure to put a cord of blue in it. That's the only requirement for the colors, as long as you got a cord of blue. Now, a lot of people that I know and have had experience with generally do the white and blue. It kind of contrasts, stands out good. That works. I also know a friend of mine, a, a brother in Yeshua, who works with the sheriff's department and because of his uniform is a darker color and he doesn't want to cause a distraction, his ZZ are black with a cord of blue. Now it has the cord of blue. So it's still staying within the scriptural commandment that is set out, right? As long as it has a cord of blue. Now, another important point to make out, is that you don't have to tie it in a certain style. You don't have to tie it, as you see here, in the Sephardic or Ashkenazi style. You don't have to tie it in the Karaite style. You don't even have to tie it in any kind of style you want. I've seen zitzit that were not braided or tied in a certain way. They were just hanging down, and they were attached to the borders, and they had a cord of blue, and they were just hanging down freely. And it was still ZZ because it's still going according to the commandment. So keep that in mind. Commandments for ZZ is that you have a cord of blue, that you wear them, and that you remember the commandments when you see them. The way you tie it, that's not scripture. That's just tradition. What other colors besides blue you wear with it is not is just a tradition. It's not commanded. Okay. So keep all that in mind. The difference between the commandment and the tradition that goes along with zitzit. And one last thing to notice from this commandment right here. Not only do we get the commandment for wearing zitzit, but we also get the reason for why 
we have the commandment for ZZ. You know, sometimes we get commandments like don't eat pork. Okay, why don't we eat pork? What's wrong with that? Well, don't eat pork. We just get the commandment, don't eat pork. But we're not told why. Here with Zeet Zeet, not only are we told to wear Zeet Zeet, to put a quart of blue in them, but we're told why. And that why is so that you remember all the commands of Yahweh and that you shall do them. And when you're wearing Zeet Zeet, I usually wear them on my belt, right? My waistline. So when I reach in my pocket, I'm rubbing up against them. Or if I look down, I get to see them. But I'm constantly reminded that these Zeet Zeet are there, which constantly reminds me of the commands of Yahweh. And that's the point. So that you remember the commands and that you would do them. Again, in Deuteronomy 22.12, make tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. So it's repeated not just once, but more than once. We even see it go on up into the Brit Hadashah, or a.k.a. New Testament. Matthew 9.20 And see, a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years came from behind and touched the zitzit of his garment. Now, some translations will actually say she touched the tassels of his garment. All right? Same thing. Just a difference in translation. But nevertheless, they were zitzit. Yeshua was a good Torah-observant Hebrew, right? So he definitely would have had zitzit on his garments. And again, Matthew 14, 35-36 and when the men of that place recognized him, <clears throat> they sent out into all that surrounding country and brought to him all who were sick and begged him to let them only touch the zitzit of his garment. And as many as touched it were completely healed. All right. So this is not like some people say an Old Testament commandment, something that's done away with. No, our Messiah himself wore zitzit. And it stands the reason the apostles and the students of the apostles also did the same thing. They wore zitzit. It's a commandment forever throughout their generations, like we just saw. Now, funny thing is, some of the very people, some of the more mainstream churches, will say that the Old Testament and things like zitzit have been done away with, but they'll do something very similar on their own. Remember a few years ago, there was this fad going around. They would have bracelets or necklaces or shirts or hats or something, but they would say, WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? And it was supposed to make you think of Jesus and remember what he would do. Okay, well, Scripture already had something like that. They're called Zizi, okay? Yeshua would have done Torah. And Zitzit are to remind us to do Torah. Except Zitzit comes from Scripture and the WWJD campaign doesn't. So why not just go with the original? Go with Scripture, right? Wearing Zitzit. Now, some of you may be thinking, especially if you've been in the Messianic faith for a while or Messianic way of thinking, well, what about women and Zitzit? Because a lot, a lot of Jewish synagogues, and there's more than a handful of Messianic congregations who do not allow women to wear tzitzit. But where does that come from? Is it scriptural or is it just a tradition? Well, oddly enough, Jewish synagogues and Jews, both men and women, wore Zitzit up until about the medieval ages. Oddly enough, you may not think of it nowadays, but at one point in history, women actually did wear Zitzit. And up until the medieval period, it was allowed for women to wear Zitzit. However, certain Orthodox rabbis in the medieval period started prohibiting women from wearing Zitzit, except when maybe in private when they're home. Okay? But it's not always been prohibited for women to wear tzitzit. And even now, there are some Messianic congregations who are waking up to the truth that it's okay for women to wear tzitzit. But where did this prohibition come from? 
Let's look again at the commandment for ZZ. Numbers 15, 37 through 40. In just the beginning, it says, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall tell them to make zizi. Right? The word to focus on here is the word children. In, I'm sorry, the phrase children of Israel. In the Hebrew, it says, B'nai Yisrael. Okay? Which literally translated means sons of Israel. Now, before we get into that, let's look real quick. Here's a mosaic from about the 1400s of a Jewish service. And as you can see here, their depiction shows women wearing zizi, showing that it actually was done. Okay? Shouldn't have moved that slide forward, but oh well, we got to it. But anyways, back to the sons of Israel point that we were making. Now, in Hebrew, it says, B'nai Yisrael, right? Which literally translated means sons of Israel. But is that what it actually means? No. It actually means children of Israel. What do I mean? Let's explain that. In Hebrew, like other languages around the world, Hebrew has masculine and feminine genders to nouns, right? And a male would be masculine, a female would be feminine, of course. So if you would have 30 men, it would be bene, sons, right? But if you would have 30 women, it would be daughters. However, if you had 29 females and only one male, it would revert back to the masculine because of that one male, that group of 29 females and one male would revert back to the masculine because of that one male and it would be bene or sons. And that's the context that we're seeing here in scripture because we know all of Israel wasn't just made up of men. Obviously not, right? There was women in there too. But since there were men in the group, obviously, then it reverts back to the masculine. So even though it says sons of Israel, the context means all of Israel, the children of Israel, right? All the people of Israel. So that's where it comes from, because some translations actually do the literal translation and say sons of Israel. But the context, and if you're someone who's learning Hebrew, keep in mind that context is king with Hebrew. You have to take just about everything into context. Take it out of context, <clears throat> and you're going to get the wrong idea. You get the wrong meaning, get the wrong translation, get the wrong understanding. So definitely remember that Hebrew is heavy on context. And so for this here, now, if you're someone who likes to study like me, the Hebrew word bene is the Strong's H1121. <clears throat> and also, if you see here on this slide, you see how it's translated within the King James translation. It's translated as son, children, old first man, young, young, child, stranger people, miscellaneous. But you can see it also includes a mixed group, like children or people. So speaking to the children of Israel, speaking to the people of Israel. A group that includes all the people, including both men and women. Now, in order to back up this point, <clears throat> we can take a look at the dietary laws. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Leviticus 11.2. Speak to the children, or b'nai, of Israel saying, these are the living creatures which you do eat among the, all the beasts that are on the earth. <clears throat> and it goes through and lists all the creatures that you eat and that you don't eat. But it's speaking to the children of Israel, B'nai of Israel. Now, obviously, we know it's not speaking to just the men, because it also applies to the women. So, 
It's the children or the people of Israel, not just the sons. And the same thing goes for Zizi. It's for the children or the people of Israel, not just the men. <clears throat> so once again, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and you shall say to them to make zitzit on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, so that you remember and shall do all my commands. So that's for both men and women. Any prohibition against women wearing zitzit is simply a tradition and not scripture. So, now we're going to get into the tradition of the tallit, because this kind of ties in with zizi. For those of you who don't know, a tallit is this prayer, or this uh, shawl, prayer shawl, whatever you want to call it, that you see the gentleman here wearing there. You also see myself wearing one right here, if I can get a good camera view of it, but I don't know. This is a tallit. Now, it's pronounced talit in modern Hebrew. It's also pronounced talet or talis, depending on which dialect you're coming from. But, yeah, we're going to pronounce it as talit because that's what we're used to. It's generally made from either wool, cotton, silk, rayon, or acrylic. Commonly, I've seen them made in wool. Now, the one I have on is acrylic. Now, it's kind of nice the fabric it's made from it's rather hard to wash i found so maybe wool would be better in that regards but there you go you can get it in various different fabrics but there's typically two different kinds of tallit you have the small tallit which is called the tallit katan and then you have a larger tallit which is called a tallit gadol now some of the tallit katans are wore underneath a typically Jewish person's outer shirt. And if you watch anyone, especially like videos from Israel, you'll see like a, almost like an undershirt hanging down from their outer shirt with tallit or zitzit hanging off of them. That is a tallit katan. Now the tallit gadol is a lot of times used for wedding uh, ceremonies as a hupa. It's used, I've seen it in some of the messianic services I've been a part of. We spread out a tallit gadol over the children when we bless the children, all sorts of things. But you typically have two different kinds of tallits, the tallit katan, tallit gadol, a smaller one and a larger one. Tallit is actually from an Aramaic word, which, meaning, which means cover. Okay, and you'll see... This in practice a lot of times when people are praying or reading Torah or something like that, they'll have the tallit draped up over their head, right? Usually not with that uh, hat on, but, you know. Anyways, they'll have it draped over their head, and it'll be covering their head. Now, now I won't get into that. But literally, tallit means a covering or something like a cloak or something, but... Nowadays, and for a long time now, it's already been understood that a tallit is a prayer shawl or something where during service like this. And like we said earlier, a tallit is also used in wedding ceremonies as a wedding camp canopy or hupa. And So important are some of these tallits that people have owned all their lives or used or are so important to them that Jewish men will sometimes actually be buried in them. They'll be Their corpse will be wrapped up in it before they're buried, and they're buried with their tallit. However, tallit is just a tradition. It's not a commandment that comes from Scripture. Scripture does not tell us to wear a tallit. It does not command us to. However, it doesn't prohibit us either. So it falls more into a neutral tradition than either a good or a bad. You know, if you want to put things black and white that way. 
more than likely the Talit was developed as a result of people wanting to obey the command for ZZ. As time went on, clothing styles changed and differed. We all know this, right? So when we got clothing styles that weren't hanging down off of us, where we could, you know, hang Zeet Zeet off the bottom of it, then they thought they needed something in order to take that place where they could display Zeet Zeet and stuff like that. So henceforth, the Talit came forth. But once again, it's not a commandment from Scripture, nor is it prohibited by Scripture. However, let's look in Matthew 9.20. And see, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the zitzit of his garment. Now, what was this garment? Okay, there's a good chance, I'm not going to say it's definite, but there's a good chance that Yeshua was wearing a tallit here. Okay, clothing styles back then probably still would have allowed for the hanging of zitzit like they did back in Moshe's time. But there's also a good chance that he could have been wearing a tallit. As well. Matthew 14, 35 and 36. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding country and brought to him all who were sick and begged him to let them only touch the zit zit of his garment. And as many as touched it were completely healed. Again, this says garment here. But it makes you think, especially within a discussion of Talit, what was that garment? Well, again, there's a good chance that it could have been a Talit that Yeshua was wearing. However, even though the wearing of a Talit is not commanded by Scripture, nor is it prohibited by Scripture, there is some ways and some things that people do that can put it into the area of bad tradition. And here's what I mean. Here's a blessing or prayer that some people, both Jewish and Messianic, say sometimes. This is the donning the tallit. And they would say, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to wrap ourselves in the tallit. Now, do you notice what's wrong with this? Before we tell you, that last line right there that says, commands us to wrap ourselves in the tallit. Okay? I've looked far and wide throughout scripture. Okay? I cannot find any command for tallit. I've done research, I've asked people. No one knows of a command in scripture that we are to wear the tallit. So therefore, this prayer or this blessing or whatever it is that says, commands us to wrap ourselves in the tallit is actually adding to scripture because everything that we are commanded to do is in scripture. And if he didn't command us to do it in scripture, then saying he did is adding to scripture. Deuteronomy 4, 2. Do not add to the word which I command you and do not take away from it so as to guard the commands of Yahweh your Elohim which I am commanding you. Deuteronomy 12, 32. All the words I am commanding you, guard to do it, do not add to it, nor take away from it. Proverbs 30, 5 through 6. For every word of Eloah is tried. He is a shield to those taking refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. So again, he tells us not to add to the scriptures. And saying that he commands us to do something that he did not command us to do is adding to the scriptures. And fortunately, a lot of Messianic congregations, a lot of Messianic people are waking up to this fact, specifically regarding this donning of the Talit prayer or blessing. And they're doing away with it. They're just not even saying it anymore. Good for them. Okay? And we definitely don't do it here for that very reason, we don't want to add to Scripture. So, once again, we now get into the question of, what about women wearing tallit? Okay, you probably already answered this by this point, but we'll go over it anyways. Lots of 
Jewish synagogues and more than one Messianic synagogue will tell you that women are not allowed to wear tallits. Okay? However, we get back into the history of the Zizi because historically speaking, women wore tallit all the way up through about the Middle Ages. And it started somewhere about the, I'm sorry, medieval ages. Somewhere about the medieval age, there started being prohibitions against women wearing tallits. And why is this? Probably because of the same prohibition against women wearing tzitzit. But again, since scripture doesn't command or prohibit tallit, there's no real scriptural basis for prohibiting women from wearing tallit. And once again, we look back at that old mosaic of a Jewish service coming from about the 1400s. And not only do you see women wearing tzitzit, but you also see women wearing tallit as well. So, again, just like with tzitzit, if you're a woman and you want to wear a tallit and a tzitzit, go for it. You're not doing anything wrong. Maybe you're going against someone's tradition, but you're definitely not going against scripture. And that's all you should be concerned about at the end of the day anyways. And here at God Honest Truth, if you want to, you know, come and hang out and fellowship and you're a woman and you want to have Talit and Zitzit, go for it. The more, the merrier, we always say. And I found this and thought it was just a beautiful picture of a woman in prayer wearing Talit. And you can't see it, but most likely there's Zitzit on the bottom of that Talit as well. So now, let's get into a discussion on yarmulkes or kippas, head coverings, as they call them. A yarmulke or a kippa is a head covering that comes in various colors and shapes and sizes. It's commonly called a kippa, but in Yiddish, it's also called a yarmulke. You've probably heard it both ways before. And this is traditionally what you think of when we talk about kippas or yarmulkes, right? The small, almost like dome-shaped um, head covering. It goes on top of there, on top of a usually a man's head. But anyways, this is the traditional style. But like we said, they also come in various styles. This is Michael Rood, and this is a, another type of yarmulke or kippa that you know can be worn as well. Now. Again, we have to examine the tradition to see where it came from, if it's right, if it's wrong, if it's some scripture, if our scripture prohibits it, all that good stuff. And we come to find out that Torah scripture does not mandate or prohibit such a custom as wearing of a yarmulke or a kippa. So therefore, it is tradition to wear one. And it's likely derived from the garments of the high priest. We'll be getting into that in just a moment. But that most likely, that's where this tradition of a yarmulke or a kippa came from. Let's look at Exodus 28, 4. And these are the garments which they make, a breastplate, a shoulder garment, a robe, an embroidered long shirt, a turban, and a girdle. And they shall make set-apart garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, for him to serve as priest to me. That turban is the head covering we're specifically talking about. And the high priest was to wear what was just described in scripture, including the turban or the head covering. And this is likely where the tradition of yarmulkes or kippahs came from, even though the majority of people who wear them are not high priests. And it's even said that the high priest would wear two head coverings, a smaller one underneath the larger one, just in case the larger one happened to fall off for some reason, he would still have his head covering on. However, it wasn't just the high priest who wore a turban or a head covering. It was also the Levites, the regular priest, as well as the high priest.
And in addition to the priesthood, we also see other people wearing head coverings also. Take, for instance, David. 2 Samuel 15.30 And Dawid went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot, and all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went. So it's not just the priests wearing head coverings. It's also the king of Israel and the people who are going with him. Now, If you come from a mainstream Christian background like I did, you may be thinking to yourself, well, what about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians? Okay, let's check that out real quick. 1 Corinthians 11.3 And I wish you to know that the head of every man is the Messiah, and the head of woman is the man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered brings shame to his head. And every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered brings shame to her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if, a, but if it is a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed should not cover his head, since he is the likeness and esteem of Elohim. But woman is the esteem of man. For man is not for woman, but woman from man. For man also was not created for the woman, but woman for the man. Because of this, the woman ought to have authority on her head because of the messengers. However, man is not independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the master. For as the woman was from the man, even so the man also is through the woman. But all are from Elohim. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to Elohim with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man indeed has long hair, it is a disrespect to him? And if a woman has long hair, it is an esteem to her, because the long hair has been given to her over against a veil. If, however, anyone seems to be contentious, we do not have such a habit, nor do the assemblies of Elohim. And that's what a lot of people will bring up when we talk about wearing of a head covering. If we go back to the beginning there. And it starts here, it says, And wish you know that the head of every man is Messiah, and the head of woman is the man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. So from the very onset, Paul here, in writing his letter to the church at Corinth, is telling us what the context is all about. It's about headship and authority, not physical heads. Tracking now? Just like he goes on to keep talking about authority and that a woman ought to have authority on her head, etc., etc., right? And if a man has any other authority as his head other than Yeshua, then it brings shame to him. And that's the whole context we're talking about here. It's talking about headship and authority. And even um, here in this last slide, it says, Does not nature itself teach you that if a man indeed has long hair is a disrespect to him? Okay, well, it was actually talking about literal heads and literal hair. What does that even mean? Okay, what is long according to Scripture? I mean, I was in the Marine Corps, and long, according to the script, or according to the Marine Corps, is anything over three inches. Okay, that was long by definition to the Marine Corps. Now, a lot of the units I was with, if you got even close to three inches, I'm not talking about being over three inches, but even close to three inches, they would consider that long and get on to you about getting a haircut, right? So, what does long even mean if it's actually talking about? physical, literal heads, and physical, literal hair. Okay? We've got to take it all into context. And keeping it all into context, here's some things to keep in mind. Number one, Paul is writing a letter to the church at Corinth. Okay? There are things we can learn from this, most definitely. But this is a letter to the church at Corinth. Let's also keep in mind some characters or some people from Scripture itself. 
Now, if you remember, Samson was a Nazarite all his life. And anyone who took the vow of a Nazarite was to shave his head and never cut his hair again until the period of his Nazarite vow was up. Right? And this could be for a long time. In the case of Samson, it was all his life. So he would never cut his hair. Now, as we all know, he was eventually deceived by one of the women he was involved with, and she ended up getting his hair cut. But, you know, according to the Nazarite vow, they would never cut their hair. So according to Scripture, long hair on a man was not an automatically bad thing. Okay? Again, we look at Absalom also. It talks about Absalom having long hair, and when he would cut his hair, they would actually weigh it, and it would be very, very heavy at the end of every year when he cut it. And they would talk about Absalom being one of the most handsome people in all of the kingdom, right, in all of Israel. But he had long hair. Ended up, his long hair got him killed because he got tangled and he got hung in it. But, you know, it never comes against Absalom for having long hair. And he was considered attractive, including his long hair, right? Now, like we said also, long hair isn't defined in Scripture. So if we're taking it physically and literally, instead of the context that Paul was talking about, how do we define long hair, right? Oh, this went over Nazarites. Another important point, uh, important point to make is that Paul himself actually took a Nazarite vow as well. There were some false witnesses who came against Paul, saying that Paul taught against the Torah of Moses. And in order to disprove that, Paul took a vow of the Nazarite. Let's look at this. 2 Samuel 14, 25 through 26. And in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his handsomeness. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for it was at every year's end that he cut it, because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels by the sovereign's weight. Now, I admittedly don't know how heavy a shekel is, but if you got 200 of them, that would be pretty heavy, I would assume, right? And that's how much his hair weighed when he cut it once a year. It would weigh 200 shekels worth of weight. So again, talking about yarmulkes and kippahs, there's really no commandment or prohibition against it in general. Now, if you are the high priest or you're in the Levitical priesthood, yeah, there's a commandment that you need to be wearing some kind of turban or head covering, but there's no temple standing. Don't really know who the Aaronic priesthood is anymore. So we go for the general and there is no commandment or prohibition against men wearing head covering, like a yarmulke or a kippa. Just a tradition. So now, this is where we really need to take your shoes off so we can have easy access to stepping on your toes. Let's talk about the Star of David. Now, if you don't know what the Star of David is, this is the Star of David. Okay, it's on all sorts of things, including the flag of Israel. It's on different decorations when they make menorahs or Hanukkahs or inv invitations for various events. You know, this is the Star of David, right? It's all over the place, widely used, has been for a while now. It's sometimes called the Magen David sometimes called the Shield of David, rarely sometimes called the Seal of Solomon, but that's just in Islam, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. However, there is no proof that we can find, no evidence that we've been able to uncover that links this Star of David to King David himself. None whatsoever. 
Now we do find it in other places though. We do find it in Hindu. This is a Hindu artwork and I don't exactly know who that is in the center there, but you can clearly see it's a six pointed triangle with a hexagon in the middle. It's a star of David coming from the Hindus. So where exactly did this whole design for star of David come from? Well, actually we don't know, or at least we here at God Honest Truth haven't been able to track down exactly where it came from. But we have been able to find mention of a star in scripture. Now hang with us here. This is going to get very interesting. Acts 7, 42 through 43. So Elohim turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it has been written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring slaughtered beasts and offerings unto me during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? And you took up the tent of Molech and the star of your mighty one, Kiyun, remember that, Images which you made to bow before them. Therefore, I shall remove you beyond Babel. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Now, let's look at another verse. Amos 5.26 But you took up Sikuth, your sovereign, and Kiyun, remember that? Your idols, your astral mighty ones, which you made for yourselves. Again, we see that name Kiyun, and we see it's something associated with the astral world or the astrological realm, right? Now, if you look at Strong's, it defines Kiyun as an image or a pillar, but probably a statue of the Assyrian Babylonian god of the planet Saturn. Kiyun, Saturn. Jesenius' lexicon states pretty much the same thing. The name of an idol worshipped by the Israelites, i.e., the planet Saturn. Round driver Briggs, proper name of deity, Assyrian Kavanu, planet Saturn. Okay. Now, on the left there, you have the standard six pointed star with the hexagon in the middle. And the two images on the right, you see it broken down the six triangles that form the outside and the hexagon that forms the inside. Okay. The point, the thing I'd like you to focus on for the moment is that hexagon that makes up the inside of a star of David. Also remember scripture talking about Kiyun and how Kiyun is defined as the pagan god Saturn or the planet Saturn. Okay. Now watch this. This is going to blow your mind if you haven't ever seen this. It's springtime on Saturn, and the hexagon is out. A perfect six-sided hurricane, 60 miles deep, that could swallow four Earths. It's ringed by winds of ammonia and hydrogen blowing 220 miles an hour. The storm was seen by the twin Voyager spacecraft when they passed by in the early 80s. That was the last time until recently that sunlight graced the north pole of Saturn, which takes 30 of our years to make one circuit of the sun. Soon after the Voyagers departed, winter descended. Saturn's rings tipped away from us, plunging the north pole into 15 years of darkness. Without sunlight, astronomers were limited to infrared images they showed the hexagon was still there. But what is it? The hexagon is a narrow jet stream that circles the North Pole. Researchers think that friction with the slower clouds on either side of it creates eddies, mini storms that push the jet stream into a wave-like shape as it goes around. By spinning columns of water at different speeds, scientists have been able to reproduce the six-sided pattern in the lab. In January of 2009, the sun began its slow rise in Saturn's north. 
summer was coming, the Cassini spacecraft was there to see it. In the coming months, Cassini will slip between Saturn and its rings to pass right over the storm for a closer look. But that's not all there is to see up north. Saturn has an aurora, its own version of the northern lights, a ring of electrical fire guided by the planet's magnetic field. Rings of ice and a dancing ribbon of aurora sitting smack on top of a six-sided hurricane. Another jewel in the crown of the solar system's most photogenic planet, where the voyage and the discoveries go on. Pretty amazing stuff, ain't it? I mean, to think that the planet Saturn, and we've just been talking about the pagan god Saturn and a star associated with him. And now we see that science itself in today's day and age reveals a perpetual hexagon-shaped storm on the planet Saturn itself. Very, very interesting stuff question comes to mind is how did people way back then, if scripture is talking about a six-pointed star, how did people way back then know that there was a hexagon on Saturn, or did they? Just by random, guess it out maybe. I don't know. But it's very, very interesting to think about, especially when you know that some face and religions and denominations have brought in things from paganism before. Now, we're not saying that's what happened with the Star of David. Definitely not saying that, okay? At this point, all the evidence that we just presented is all circumstantial as far as the Star of David being the Star of Kiyun mentioned in Scripture. All circumstantial, Okay. However, we still have no evidence that the Star of David actually came from something in Scripture, something good and righteous in Scripture anyways. We have no evidence of that. Or that it was associated with King David at all. We don't even know where it came from definitively at this point. I just brought up the whole Saturn, planet Saturn, perpetual hexagon on Saturn thing for something you to think about, okay? Maybe there'll be more evidence that comes to light in the future. We'll be able to put it all together, but it's kind of interesting that the Star of David is made up of six points, six triangles, and a six-sided hexagon. The planet Saturn is the sixth planet in our solar system, and the English name Saturn has six letters in it. I mean... It's very, very interesting to think about, but again, don't jump to conclusions over all this, okay? That does not by any means mean that that's where the Star of David came from or why it exists or anything like that. Again, it's all just circumstantial evidence at this point and something to think about <clears throat> because Scripture doesn't say what the Star of Kiyun actually looked like, how many points it had, Nothing like that, okay? Just something very, very interesting to think about. So, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight for tonight's service. <clears throat> Hope you did get something out of it. Hope that too many of your toes weren't stepped on. You'll still be able to walk tomorrow. Now, in just a moment, we'll be doing the Aaronic or Priestly Blessing. So if you have anyone there with you that you like to have gathered around when we do that, go ahead and start gathering them around you. And while you're doing that, make sure to go down below. Tell us in the comments what it is that you thought of tonight's service and tonight's drosh, whether it's about the content, the quality of the video, or what have you. Just leave us a comment down below. Also be sure to hit that like button or the dislike button if you disliked it. <clears throat> but tell us why you disliked it also. Hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified. And also hit that share button and share it around with your friends, family, colleagues, or who have you. <clears throat> I'm about to lose my voice. 
Now, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact us at team at godhonesttruth.com. We do our best to respond in a timely manner, but we can only respond in the order they come in. So if it a little bit of a delay, please don't take offense. We'll get to it just as soon as we can. So now let's go ahead and end our service with the Aaronic Benediction. Yivarekka Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Yair Yahweh Panavi Lecha, Vihunecha. Yisah Yahweh Panavi Lecha, Vayasim Lecha, Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and guard you. May Yahweh make his face shed light upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his face unto you and give you peace. Thank you once again for joining us tonight. We hope you have a good and restful Shabbat coming up right now and tomorrow as it goes on the Gregorian calendar. We hope that your next upcoming week is filled with good food, good fortune, good family, good friends, good health, good spirits. And until we see you again next week at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, make sure to take care of yourself, take care of each other. Shavua Tov and Shabbat Shalom. Oh.